Welcome to Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I'm your host, Levi Strom. Transcripts of today's episode are brought to you by a generous donation by Jeannie Nassaro of Beehaven Hill Farms. Thank you, Jeannie. Additional funding provided by Aram Stoney at Big Sur Canna Botanicals. On today's episode, I speak with Chef Sebastian Carosi about cooking with cannabis. My name is Chef Sebastian Carosi. I'm better known as the short order cannabis revolutionary. And that short order cannabis revolutionary thing kind of falls under that. It, it gives me a, a, a moniker. Um, I was a five diamond chef. Um, I worked for the Bush family. I worked for President Sarkozy of France. Um, and mind you, I'll back up. And at 17, I was a, uh, a young cannabis consumer because of what I, I didn't know at the time, but it was medicinal reasons other than wanting to get high. Um, I had a tremendous bout of ADHD. And um, at the time I had, I didn't have PTSD, but five years later, I would have PTSD from getting out of prison at 24, going in at 18, 17 and 18. Um, so I kind of had to make a decision. Uh, this is pre-prison. Now we're thinking back again now. Um, and I had to tell myself that reality was re- re- approaching really fast. So I was going to be a banker, a chef, or a mortician. This is me in my 11th grade year talking. Yeah, I was going to be a rock star, a basketball player, or I don't even know what the third option was, but it wasn't <laughs> what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I, um, my father was a doctor, is a doctor. He dumped a cadaver out in front of me. No, thank you. No bodies for me. Um, I watched the monetary system in my lifetime. You know, I used to go to the store as a child and for $1, I would buy handfuls of candy. And I hate to use candy as an example. I'm just, you know, commodity wise, I'm just trying to give you an example. Now you go to the store and you can get one little piece of candy for that same dollar. So I, I've seen the dollar just, you know, do the dip and dive. And it didn't seem that banking, my family owns a few banks in Italy. And I thought that that would, might have been, you know, a choice for me. But just the, the dip and dive on the dollar was not uh, not fun for me. And then two years later, when I was still doing the same research under the same feeling, I found out how much blood was lost over a dollar. I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. Um, so I chose culinary um, and I chose culinary after that prison sentence that I got for cannabis crimes. Um, and, and you were I, just, just in case I cut out that first part, <laughs> like you, you went to jail for seven, how long for seven years? So when I was for transporting uh, flour across yeah, state lines, 15, 16 and 17, I, I grew up in Kitsap County, Washington, right around Puget sound. And uh, woo-hoo, I played for Kitsap County baseball. Uh, and <laughs> I there's a lot of growers up there, a lot of horticulture, a lot of agriculture, um, a lot of basement bandits, a lot of closet cultivators uh, on the larger scale. Um, cannabis was five thousand dollars a pound at the time. Right. Uh, here. Yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I got in with a few good guys and uh, they were able to supply me with the cannabis and I was able to make some sales because I was a young kid. I was into foraging. So I was all over the woods. I ran into like minded people. I would go to the festivals. I'd ride the green tortoise bus line if I could, you know, and it's just like this whole, the whole can of culture that I was surrounded in because of my family. Um, and I started transporting it because I met a lady in the Victoria, BC ferry terminal, um, a 400 pound black lady that slung hash. She sat there and she slung hash all day. She'd measure it off, snip you a piece, measure it off, snip you a piece. And finally I was like, how much to get your whole roll? She was like, damn son. So I ended up going up there, trading her all the time, pretty much on a weekly basis. And the Coast Guard had noticed that there was a small boat coming in and out of Daybob Bay, crossing the Sound in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. You know, this is a (laughs) Mm -hmm. like going from Gibraltar over. He's not just transporting oysters. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Funny thing is, is we got to get back to that. Um, So unfortunately, the Coast Guard caught me, called me in um, the... uh, the, the feds did not want to pick it up because I was so young. Um, the state picked it up. I got five years on, I did five on seven. I got a seven year beef. Um, I started at uh, McNeil Island, Clallam Bay, Walla Walla, um, Shelton. Um, I lost my custody 
in the penitentiary because I was uh, approached by, you know, people that were not my race or telling me what I had to do, forcing me into racist situations that I wasn't a part of. I didn't grow up that way. Um, you know, yeah, the prison system, I've never gone to jail, but I have friends who have, and it gets pretty balkanized pretty quickly. And, and everyone kind of retreats into their camp for survival. Um, it's an, it's an unfortunate, it's, it's like a microcosm of like high school at its worst or something, you know, like I, I can't even imagine, man. And, and for a, a, such a young man to go to jail over weed, I don't care what amount of weed it is. It's fucking weed it is crime. That's the crime. So I'm so yeah, sorry that that happened. I appreciate that. I, so the funny thing is, is that when you say it back, it's, when you said it back to me, it brought me back to that time. And it was like, I had half of my head shaved and the other half was this long. I looked like Tony Hawk. I was a skater, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm walking on the gray line with people that have like done crimes that I, I don't even talk about. Right. You don't belong there. <laughs> These two things do not, um, be, you know, one of these things does not belong here. The guy selling weed does not belong with the rapist murderers. You know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's so, still to this day, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I was caught. Um, I did my time. I went to, I entered the Washington state penal system. I went all over the pe penal system. Um, I, had strong beliefs when I went in there. My family didn't come here until 1948. We're from Abruzzo, Italy. And my skin is white, but, and they automatically assume that you don't have any other ethnic makeup if your skin is white. And unfortunately I had to let them know that I couldn't be a racist because I, first of all, it's not in me. Second of all, I come from a country that's made up of more people than America is made up of. So I couldn't say, you know, oh, yeah, I can be racist towards this. Guy. It was really weird because, like you said, it pigeonholed people into these, a situation. I didn't – my best friend in the penitentiary was a, a, a black kid I played baseball with, you know, last name Studemeyer. And me and him hung all the time, and it was, it was never going to change. They weren't going to change that in me. And it's just like the government didn't change in me my cannabis beliefs once I got out. Um, that – remain the same. I felt like an outlaw. Um, when I got out of prison, I actually went to culinary school in Portland, Oregon, um, Western Culinary Institute. It became Oregon Culinary Institute. Um, and uh, a year out of school, I went to work for the Bush family in Kenny Bunkport, Maine. Hmm. How did you get that job? I just applied for it. And I hmm. didn't lie. You know, when they, when they ask, have you been convicted of a crime? Yeah, I've been convicted of a crime. And here's my crime and here's my paperwork. I'm not scared to show it. It's cool. Uh, they hired you. I mean, that kind of makes me like the Bush family a little bit more. I never was into politics. I never had a political conversation with them. I'm still not into politics nowadays. Unfortunately, they've stripped Smart. my right. To vote. Smart. Yeah, right. No, you're probably better off, honestly. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, so, so it leaves me with conversations with people like Barbara Bush about lobsters. Mm -hmm. you know? Right, right, right. Perfect. And <laughs> about cigars. And they all knew that I would go to the entrance of the property behind the secret service entrance shed and smoke weed. I've got pictures of me doing it mm -hmm. every day. Right. Um, and, and they didn't, they never yeah. tried to deter me. They never called my boss. They never reported me. They never did anything. Um, right. And as a matter of fact, they, and I'm not boosting them up by any means, they recommended me to their neighbor in his $45 million estate. The neighbor mm. was president Darkozy of France at the time. Hmm. So I would do three days at Zarkozy's and three days at the bushes cooking lobsters in Maine. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. I have, a, I have a feeling the bushes were probably cooler about weed than the, than uh, the Reagans would have been, you know, I don't think Nancy Reagan would have <laughs> been, been saying <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you never know people, you know, rep, you know, it, People, you know, weed, the thing about cannabis is that everyone loves it. When, you know, I'm a, yeah. I studied sociology and sociologists do these anonymous surveys, right? And that's when people actually answer things honestly, when they know that no one can pin them to their answers. <laughs> and uh, people that identify as conservatives smoke just as much weed as everybody else. And they, and, you know, they're every, you know, not everyone smokes and loves weed, but most people honestly do. And at least when they're asked about it, you know, if they're not daily smokers, they're, they're totally fine with it. People aren't stupid. They know that this plant is, is basically probably one of the most harmful herbs on earth. And what would you rather have somebody doing? Would you rather have your kids smoking weed or doing, you know, 
crack or meth or heroin. Exactly. All the parents are going to say, I'd rather have them smoking weed, you know? And so it's just common sense stuff, but it gets lost in policy and politics. And luckily we're not here to talk about politics. We're here to talk about food, which is, which is cool because, um, and I want, I want you to continue your story about the bushes. I don't want to get too side railed, but I just think it's, it's just like, what a twist in your life. You come out of prison, you get thrown in prison as an underaged, a juvenile yeah. into federal prison. I just know state prison, the feds wouldn't pick it up. So, so state, state, okay, prison. that's right. So state, but, but state adult state prison as yep. a kid. Okay. So that's gonna, that's gnarly. <laughs> that's well, crazy. Hey, you know and, and yeah no absolutely one, one of my best friends growing up is still in the system unfortunately and once you get locked into it it's really hard to get out so good on you for getting out and it sounds like you got out and you immediately applied yourself to something you went and you studied uh, in portland at the culinary at uh, the western culinary institute got your culinary arts degree yeah. immediately went out and found this job with the bushes which probably at the time i don't know what they were paying but it was probably like a dream job right i mean it was a dream job. And it was actually, you know, I was working for a caterer out of Kenny Bunkport, Maine, um, Maine, and the, the company was called Kitchen Chicks. And I just got hired on as a cook. And I was one of only a few that spoke English because the entire crew was Jamaican that they would come in for the season. And I obviously got along with the Jamaicans really well. All right. <laughs> <laughs> So it would be uh, the Jamaicans and I pretty much on every job. And we got picked for the Bushes and Zarkozy almost every time by the Bushes and Zarkozy. Uh It was really fun for us because, you know, they're getting a kick out of it. They're like, I can't believe we're cooking lobsters for the Bushes. And I'm like, I can't believe we're cooking lobsters for the Bushes. (laughs) Uh, It was a great thing. Yeah. And so so for me, um, you know, when you say cook back then, um, my cooking with cannabinoids was very limited. Um, people were still stuck on the uh, um, infusing butter and doing things with that. We'd move right. past the brownies, but we'd still in this whole block of an era of time have only used cannabinoids in sugar-based vehicles. And mm-hmm. that for me sucks. I'm a type one, type two diabetic. I just was diagnosed less than two years ago. Um, Thanks, Grandma, by the way. Um, (laughs) So the discouragement in me, Levi, to see when I walk into a dispensary, a pot shop, um, at whatever you want to call it, store, whatever, um, in in this day and age, and and you can, um, and in the cannabis shop, cannabis flour has less shelf space than the gummies and sugar. Mm -hmm. It is so disappointing because it tells me that we not only miss, we only miss the mark when we legalized and recreationalized under the auspices of medicine and medicinal uses, that doesn't mean sugar. Sugar is not a cancer combat. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite. So when we have these dispensaries that don't even try, well, first of all, I would go back to the dispensary operator and the dispensary uh, workers that have no education whatsoever they cannot name seven terps. They don't right. know. And it's really sad um, yeah. because you have the older sector going in and saying, I want to leave these pharmaceutical drugs, these psychotropic drugs. I want to leave these alone. What is it in cannabis that's going to help me? I've heard it can help me. Whether it be CBD, uh, CBG, CBN, the entire alphabet soup of the components that we've found in the, cannab- in the cannabis plant. Um, They can't even really direct people in a proper manner unless behind the scenes, they've got this yearn to want to be not the bud tender with the buds hanging around their neck and the hats and the, you know, talking to the kids, but being able to hit every person that comes into that dispensary's need. When the older lady comes in and is like, I need to get off of this Prozac. Oh, you need this fire right here. You need GMO cookies. And it's like, that lady doesn't know what a damn GMO cookie is. She also doesn't know what fire is. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> right. You're going to scare. <laughs> Don't scare <yeah>. grandma. <laughs> you know, we're completely missing the mark when it comes to, and that's why I think that we have states like, and I'm sorry, I'm going to peg Idaho, 
but Idaho that are like, hell no, we aren't letting this in right now. We're going to wait and let watch the cookie crumble, you know? Um, and I'm an activist in Idaho. I'm at Boise Hemp Fest every year. I help promote it. I help put it on. Um, my friend sounds like a party, man. <laughs> I want to go this year. I, I'm serious. This oh. year, believe it or not, Levi, um, we have uh, taken on um, a whole another sector. And I'm going to jump to another totally different topic because we're on this. But we have a company called Camp Ruderalis. And there, there's conversations about cannabis every damn second of the day. And indigo makes it into the conversation and sativa makes it into the conversation. And then hybrid makes it into the conversation. But the word ruderalis never, ever makes it into the conversation. And the funniest part about this all is it's one of the first cannabis plants that was ever discovered on its own. No males around flowering off the side of the Himalayan mountains by a woman was wild cannabis, a.k.a. ruderalis. Mm -hmm. Didn't need a male to flower. It's what we call autoflower cannabis now. Yep. Every strain of cannabis that everybody likes to this day is now bringing bread with ruderalis and autoflower. Why? It's simple. A 100-day crop now takes 56 days. That's two crops. They used to say autoflower has no potency. Throw that right out the window because when you mix an auto naturally, you cross pollinate it with something like White Widow or something, you can get the 27%. It's scientifically been proven. So they can't tell me that anymore either. It's amazing uh, what you can do with plant breeding because I always hear that everyone's like, oh, you'll never be able to get above 30% THC. And now we're like, I'm pretty sure we're at 40. You know, you'll never be able to get CBD above 10%. It's an, I've, I, remember, I remember people telling us it's impossible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Well, Give it, give it a couple of years. So, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. And as a grower, I always shunned ruderalis because it was weaker, but I'm sure by now, and I haven't grown commercially in a long time, and I'm sure by now they've got it all dialed. And for people that have no idea what we're talking about, ruderalis is considered the third type of cannabis. You've got, generally speaking, your indicas from like the Hindu Pakistan region. You got your sativas from like Southeast Asia and Latin America. Then you have ruderalis from China and Russia, the super cold, dark areas. So cannabis flowers on a lighting schedule, but because these plants, you know, grew for hundreds of thousands of millions of years in an area where the light, it would be dark for 24 hours a day or light for 24 hours a day. It became like independent to the light cycle. It just has its own internal clock, which for a grower is a huge advantage because now you can get, like you said, uh, plants to harvest quicker. Um, they're going to start flowering quicker. So you don't have to do the light depth thing. And it's really cool. It's, it, it, you know, I'm, I've been out of cultivation hardcore, but I know that has probably gone crazy with breeding ruderalis and everything. So you probably know more than I do at this point. Don't, don't get me wrong. I do not have, I have one plant in my house. It's a vermilion, dude. I can't. Not <laughs> it's all right. Shut, you just focus on cooking. That, that's all right. Everybody can't do everything. <laughs> and you know, my, my whole, uh, my whole juxtaposition and soapbox in this cannabis industry is trying to get people to use uh, cannabis for what it is, a raw agricultural crop that grows in the field with many, many medicinal values to it. And unfortunately, the medicinal values dissipate into dollar signs for all these people. Sure. I've never seen so many farmers in suits living in high rises driving <laughs> on time with vehicles. Right. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a challenge for me because my background for food is always searching that farmer, the farmer, mm -hmm. not the lab, you know, and when we start talking about other things, you know, our conversations quickly change when it becomes plant based. When we start talking about psilocybin and psilocybin therapy, <laughs> I have a huge proponency to tell people these are lab grown and cultivated. That's great. But I've been working with decriminalization of California right now because we've already got Oregon going and we've already got Washington going. And I want people to know that just like a source of wild things, as we talk about ruderalis, when you talk about psilocybin, you talk about something that was grown in a, in a plastic cooler in somebody's basement general. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I live in the Pacific Northwest. I have a 27 mile stretch of beach that in 1976, Paul Stamets just happened to stumble on these little, little brown mushroom caps in the dune grass. They were called psilocybe azorescence. 
not cyanescence, but azurescence. They happen to be the most psilocybin-dense mushroom on the planet. Mm. They're all over the place. They're free. Mm -hmm. They're right. Free. Right. That's the, the I, I, as a chef, I always tried to get people back to the source of the cleanest, wildest, non-conformed through a human grow, non-manipulated source of medicines that we can do. When I became a diabetic, Levi, they gave me this drug called metformin, a little pill. It was actually a horse pill. It was about an inch long. And I was like, this is cool, but it's going to be hard getting down. What's in it? And the doctor couldn't tell me. I was like, so you can't tell me what's in the pill you just gave me? You prescribed me? You're still practicing, buddy? And uh, he's like, okay, cool. So we're going to look it up. So we looked it up and it was held together with sucrose mo molecules. Now I'm a diabetic here. And sucrose is a form of sugar. Mm -hmm. and I said, why are you giving me sucrose daily with metformin to control my sugar levels internally? And he couldn't answer the question. So I said, okay, cool. I'm going to take this. I took it. Three weeks, I threw up the contents of my meal every day at 3.30 in the morning. My body was rejecting the metformin. So when it comes to that, I got that, the, the, the thinking of that, they're doing the same thing with a lot of cannabinoids. I got products from, from, from a friend the other day. I appreciate it too. <laughs> right on. One hits anybody that's looking for no flavor, no nothing, medicine. Mm -hmm. One, and I'm going to tell you this, and over there on my shelf, I have 600 bottles. I work for 35 Washington I-502 and OLCC companies as a freelancer. I've developed mm, 70 of these things. I'm not saying this because this is your show, but the cash and orange one is the best fucking thing I've put in my mouth in a long damn time. Nice man, thank you. That that's our newest product, so I appreciate the Bro, feedback. I'm just I'm going to tell you. I'm in, in all honesty. When I look for products, those are the things we look for. I got two high times judges kits sitting over here right now. I four six B and four B. Um, it's pretty cool for me, even though I'm a judge for this. But I developed three of the products in the boxes that I'm judging. Um, so when I see things like this and I see people going to, first of all, um, and I'm not this, just because this is your show, uh, I, I'm not doing this in, at all. Uh, label, brand, bottle, color conformity, eye appeal. This was like, this is like getting one of the best bag of weeds I got in a long time. Yeah. I'm trying, I'm trying to rep the like farmer's market vibe. You know, it's like, that's what this is to me. Cannabis is food and I think, I think you should be able to, I, I, I wish, and I hope someday we get rid of all the dispensaries and that's like, it'll be something we'll be talking about in 20 years going, remember we had those weird, like liquor <laughs> store, like kind of cannabis dispense. That was so weird. Right. Now you just go to the grocery store and get it, or you go to your farmer's market where it's 18 and over or whatever you got to do. You show your ID, there's a security guard, and then you walk in and you get to go talk to me who's making my little tinctures and I can show you exactly how I make it. The flower that I use. You can go talk to the farmer and he can tell you the amendments he's using and show you, and you can really have a connection to the farmer, to the source ingredient. And, and since we're kind of there, I want to ask this question because I think the slow food movement is so important and I'm trying to do that too with the wake end and like, you know, the solvent lists and like single strain and really like slowing down this fast track to like isolates and distillates and roll it off the assembly line gummies and, and sugar pops and all that. And and that's fine. Like, I think that's cool that there's, I, I don't shame any products. I want it all, but there's always I think gonna be a Walmart. there's always going to be a Walmart. And there's, there's always going to be that. And some people want that and that's totally fine, yeah. but we don't want to get rid of all the craft artisan producers because uh, right now it's kind of what's happening. I mean, I, I can get, I can get down on it sometimes because California is, you know, California I don't know how it is in Washington, but in California, they've really overregulated the space and made it really tough on the small producer. And I imagine it's the same up there, but on the slow food movement. So how do you see slow food and cannabis aligning? Like, how did we remove the stigma of like stoners and fast food and kind of like you're talking about sugar and sweets? Like, how do we return this back to the plant and back to like the holistic approach? Like, how do you actually convince consumers to do that who want expediency and convenience and they want free two-day shipping with amazon and they want everything right now like how do we 
as artists and craft producers, like combat that, like, how do we carve out our space in this industry? I'm genuinely asking, cause I don't know. So I have done it the simplest way I knew how I stuck to who and what I am. And I didn't deviate my, my food and my philosophy is based around the slow food philosophies. If there's a, a producer in my area, and by my area, I mean in my region that produces something, I'm not going to go and step outside of my region to find it and bring it in. First of all, for two or three reasons, economics, economics, and my heart. Mm-hmm. My heart leads the decision on my purchases all the time. I made that mandatory as a chef from the beginning. Why? Because my grandma. Why? Because I grew up on a farm. Why? Because I was the one at the farmer's market selling all those vegetables 15 and 20 years ago. Um, the, the, the most important factor for me, Levi, in that situation is going to be not the, it's, it's the heart part. And the heart part is, is that if there's a farmer down the street that I know, maybe I only know him a little bit, but I do know who he is. And I do know that he's making XYZ product at his farm. I'm going to buy that product from him because if his daughter needs dance shoes or his daughter needs food in her mouth or their animals need husbandry or their farm needs a new fence post. When I drive by that farm, I help support that farm. I did everything I could for my neighbor. Nobody does shit for their neighbors anymore. When you move into a new neighborhood, when's the last time your neighbor made you a batch of cookies? Never. Do you remember what America used to be like? Because I do. Right. Yeah. The, you're right. Rural life. And and now it's like the media has us all divided, right? It's like counties, counties, Republicans, Democrats, all this nonsense. And yeah, restoring community through food is probably the best way to do that because you cannot hate somebody that's preparing food for you. You know, you can't, it's, it's absolutely impossible. And then the disconnect in the cities and we need the cities on board too, because we need these farm to fork movements so that because it's so when you live in Los Angeles, it's really easy to get disconnected from the farmer down the street. You never even seen a farm. Most people in LA have never even seen a plant growing, you know. But they still know. We still have this, and even if we're not in nature and we're surrounded by asphalt, we still like there's still a part of us that longs for it. And if somebody can go to a restaurant that's farm to table and, and feel good about the food they're eating or buy some weed or a product that they feel like they actually know where it's coming from and they're making a impactful consumer decision that's what i think like on the marketing side like people like you and i and people are trying to do that we have to be really good at the marketing we have to like get our message out there and compete with the mcdonald's yeah yeah Yeah. And, and my thing is as a chef is check this out i used to tell everybody everybody back in the day used to brag like hell that they were farm to fork well guess what mcdonald's gets their fucking tomatoes from a farm and their lettuce too they're farm right 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 yeah uh So for me, I kept it really simple. I followed my protocol and my guidelines from what my grandma told me, from what my grandma did. I'm a short order cannabis revolutionary. So I was doing, I was opening four and five diamond facilities. I was running some of America's at the time, Relais Chateau restaurants where there's only 40 of them in America. Um, But what you would find from me is in that dish, and I got questioned a lot, Tuna noodle casserole made with ahi tuna. Right. You know, what would you see for lunch? You might see a sloppy joe sandwich made with buffalo mm-hmm. from one of Tim Turner's ranches. Why? Because that's what American can associate with. American right. can't associate with tweezer food. Tweezer right. food equals elitism in food, which means the price is going to go up. But here's the thing. A rich person didn't forage the truffles a peasant like my family members did. So who really knows how to enjoy those truffles? You know what I'm saying? Not the person that's going to put it on their social media account with the pinky up going, Hey, pinkies up. We're eating Tom Ford suits. Truffles. No, first of all, that's not me. You can, people should be able to tell that from the profile I put out there, but there's a lot of hidden things. People just, <laughs> they think because you write for high times that you're a multimillionaire and you live in this, you live in, oh my God, you're this, that. So I'm going to get back to a point you made. Um, food has broken people down into socioeconomical lines and demographics, and it's been pissing me off forever. Because today, if I don't have enough money to eat a $9 hot dog, guess what? I'm going to eat a 29 cent hot dog. 
And when I have enough money to eat a $9 hot dog, I'm going to need a $9 hot dog. But if you judge me for eating hot dogs and you pigeonhole me into a socioeconomic group because I eat ramen, hot dogs, franken beans, or anything that you consider poor food, I consider the food that made my family survive through any hard times. So if yours was steak, that's cool with me. But there's going to be a time that you're not going to be able to get that steak. And the knowledge that I've hidden in my mind about where and how to go get food during tough times, I can walk out and survive. I don't need a refrigerator. I don't need anything like that. So when you with your pinky up, not you particularly, Levi, but them with their pinky up in the elitist attitude with, <laughs> with food and with products, approaches people like me. When I was at the farmer's market, I had truffles, chanterelles. I was the chef that had a farmer's market stand and an organic farm, 32 acre organic farm. But underneath the table, I sold cannabis pesto, cannabis hummus, mm. cannabis salad dressings. So on a good day, on a Saturday here in the Pacific Northwest, let's say I would be at the Salmon Creek Farmer's Market. I'd do about $1,300 in vegetables on the top of the table. My cooler with the cannabis hummus, pesto, and salad dressings would do around four and a half grand. Every old lady, and sorry, I don't mean to make it like that, but every <laughs> old lady man in Clark County that didn't want to go to a pot shop because of the way they were treated was lined up at my farmer's market booth. And the farmer's market manager was a close friend of mine. She was actually a beekeeper that grew cannabis, so she didn't care. But from that, we spawned a farmer's market an all cannabis farmers market, an underground farmers market, where exactly what you just said happened. We operated for three years. Um, so for we, me, tried, we tried that in LA. We operated for two weekends. Yeah. <laughs> and then I ended up in a three-year lawsuit <laughs> with the city of LA. <laughs> I've noticed in LA, and I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. I was raised around a lot of Italians that believe in a lot of words like omerta and family. There's a lot of rats and cheese eaters in LA, I found out. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. So when we get to the healthy aspects of food and cannabis, and I'm not doing this for an advertising employee. As a matter of fact, if you want to cut it out, you can. But <laughs> High Times Magazine. You wouldn't expect High Times to run a salad, would you? No. You wouldn't. Open up High Times Magazine. Avocado toast from Chef Sebastian Carosi. Looks good. High Times has got a pulpit. Yep. They're not running recipes about brownies no more. Right. Right. No. Why? Because they know their yep. movement and they have been crushed. They get a bad name. They get a good name. They get all this. And they're trying to move with the times with legal cannabis and still be the biggest media cannabis media business out there. Um, I that was a bucket list thing for me, Levi. They called me and said, hey, chef, can you throw us a few recipes for the next four issues? And hey, throw us one for the 420 issue too. And I'm like almost in tears. And I'm like calling my dad going, guess what? Guess what? <laughs> you know what I mean? To other people, they're like, oh, you're in high times. And it's like, who else is giving me a voice to tell you to cook with cannabis by making a salad or avocado toast? Yep. No, it's amazing. Nope. And it gives you a brand. I mean, <clears throat> it, it instantly catapults. I don't think anybody, I, I would do it. I don't know. I think anybody would be foolish not to take up an offer from high times and they are pivoting their models and trying to adapt. And, but I think, you know, what you're talking about with like the sugar and switching to a more mature use of the plant. Like, I think that's where the industry is at right now. The industry is kind of an immature industry right now. It's all about youth culture and, and kind of pop bubble gum hype brands are really big, you know, and. You guys and, opened a cafe in California, mm -hmm. low cafe in LA. Mm -hmm. Remember that? I, I remember it. Yeah, I never went. <laughs> but I remember. The, the world's first cannabis cafe. Cannabis restaurant, right? That was the monikers. Right. But you couldn't eat no cannabis there. Right. It was ridiculous. So, yeah. It was a cannabis consumption cafe where you right. could eat your food and smoke at right. the same time. Right. It sucked because Andrea yeah. Dimmer is still running on the fact that she opened the first cannabis cafe. No, 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 no. First of all, she never serves, never served cannabis in that cafe. She couldn't by legal, by legal action. She couldn't. Right. She also, she had the abilities to serve hemp leaves as a salad ingredient, but didn't. Why? Because she didn't know how. 
And I'm not right. talking shit about Andrea. I'm just talking about her abilities. So when when the media gets on the bandwagon of first cannabis cafe, go eat your cannabis, but there's no cannabis and you can smoke a joint, that's all. That hurt drastically yeah. everywhere. I think it let everybody down, I remember, because there was so much fanfare about it. And everyone was hyped about it. Like people were like leaving their families from the Midwest to come and be a waitress at the Lowell Herb Cafe. I knew it was all bullshit because I knew what the laws were. And I was like, this is never going to work. They can't serve real edibles. This is stupid. Like it's a consumption lounge. Nobody cares. And, you know, and they spent $50,000 on a chandelier or whatever they did. It was just like a ridiculous uh, vanity project. But um, when that happened, I got really, really irate. And I started going after the USDA and the FDA really hard with teams of lawyers. And I have just gotten licensed. I'm the first, my partner is because I'm a a felon. I can't. Uh, We are the first USDA and FDA licensed hemp farm that is licensed to sell you microgreens, juicing greens, and salad greens. Amazing. All of you chefs out there that want to cook with cannabis, get on the fucking bandwagon and start putting it in your salads, your spanakopitas, your greens, your spinach, and everything. Because right now, Cannabis has more vegetarian-based protein than kale and spinach alone. Why aren't we touching on that subject? We're all talking about being high. Get high and eat some good cannabis leaves is what I'm trying to get you to do. Exactly. This is the other side of it that so rarely gets talked about. And, you know, THC, the molecule is always going to get the most attention because of what it does. And and I'm a huge fan. Mm -hmm. But you know, I make my raw products both in the hemp and cannabis space because I want people to be exposed to the unadulterated plant, the unheated form of it, which is an incredibly powerful anti-inflammatory. And there's all these amazing medicinal values. It's also a superfood. It's beyond a superfood. It's a functional beyond food. It. It's what the Japanese would call a functional food. It, it yeah. goes far beyond its dietary value. It has medicinal value. And when you call something medicine, it creates this barrier to where now it's only something you use when you're sick. And I don't believe that about cannabis. Cannabis is food, yeah, right? It's preventative and you don't just have to smoke a joint and and God bless you. If you do, I know I will probably shortly after this uh, interview, but I take raw cannabis every day. I use my topicals. I ingest the tinctures. I do, you know, when I used to grow, I would juice the leaves and wheatgrass juice or I'd throw the nugs in my smoothies I would chop them up into my salad. I take the raw. I was talking with another guy, Ron Spencer from Biosync, and he's a hemp farmer and he takes his dried nugs and uses them as a dry rub on tri-tip. Yep. And it's amazing. I mean, the terpene, like cannabis has so many culinary uses that unfortunately get completely lost to like just add distillate into your brownie mix and you're done or, you know, make some can of butter and you're done. I wanted, so I want to do like, it sounds like salad is kind of like your, your thing right now and avocado toast, but do you have like a favorite cannabis dish right now? Uh, that's hard, man. You just, like, they, are, are, do you like working with like the, like the raw leaf? Is that kind of like one of your favorite creative ways to incorporate? I was going to ask you too, like, what is the most underutilized part of the plant? Would you say that's like the raw leaf? No, the roots are the most the roots. Underutilized. Yeah. So how would you? I used to make a root tincture, but how would you use the roots culinarily? So realistically, depending on if you're growing and remember, I'm not a grower. Um, I'm not a grower at all. I don't know how to grow. I don't, I, I, I couldn't tell you, but what I can tell you is the studies that we've been doing for the past three years, that if you have a hydroponic or a reservoir situation and your roots touch any part of the basin, anywhere from the sides to the top, there are bacteria between the basin reservoir and the roots, no matter what anybody says. So any roots that touch your basin or reservoir, not the water, but the, 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 the physical reservoir itself, I would not consume. I wouldn't even make RSO out of it. I wouldn't make anything out of it because there are so many myotoxins, molds, things that are growing that are unseen in there that we won't know for a long time. Uh, but juicing, if you can juice the root, a lot of the lipids tend to be in the root systems, not in the actual plant. So lipids mean something for me because I'm a diabetic. They may not mean something for anybody else. I personally, when I eat cannabinoids, I eat it the exact opposite that everybody thinks me as a chef eats it. 
I eat it what I call Bob Marley style. And a lot of people don't realize that Bob Marley's strain was about 7% THC, 7% CBD. Mm. It was an equal balance. That's why he was smoking all day. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And it goes back to the genetics. And when we were trying to get 14 CBD and 14 THC to have a nice ride across the board, you know, um, oh, fuck, I'm a stoner. And I lost I, my train. I stone. tell people all the time, my favorite weed on earth, like what I, what I like to smoke, I make a one-to-one -one tincture. That okay. comes from a strain called Dr. Green Shock from Green Shock Farms. It's 8% total THC, 8% total CBD, has a beautiful terpene, is super tasty, cushy. I can smoke it all day. It's yeah. so relaxing and enjoyable. I, I'm not, you know, too far out of my mind. Um, and then later on, I can take a dab of some rosin, you know, to get there. But like for my daytime smoke, yeah, it's the Bob Marley way. And, and I think that's true too, not just Marley, but I think they're finding now, like even just back in the fifties, like a lot of the weed they're smoking on Stanford university, I was reading this article, like, um, you know, Aldous Huxley and a lot of these like psychedelic, uh, explorers, they're smoking weed back then too, but they were smoking stuff that was 7% THC with a lot of CBD and so when they talk about like how weed's so different now, well, they're kind of right. I mean, we've basically bred out all the CBD, which actually kind of takes down the psychoactive effect of THC. So you don't get that paranoia. That's what I don't like. That's the one thing I don't like about weed is sometimes you smoke a little too much and you're like, <clears throat> like you feel like life gets shoved up and it's kind of an experience and you just kind of yeah. accept it as a smoker where you're like, all right, this is going to happen. But if you just have a little bit of CBD, it totally takes that away. And then you kind of get this nice floaty high without that, like, Oh God, I'm lifting off to Jupiter. And I don't know if I'm going to ever come back. Like it just kind of keeps you in this nice kind of middle ground. And I think most people would enjoy that. Like, I think most people that haven't smoked weed in 20 years, if they knew that there was something out there that was seven and seven, and there is now, I think you'd get a lot of people coming back in and maybe they're not going to smoke. Maybe they, they find it in another way, but there, there are more people right now that are not consuming cannabis that I think will if it's presented to them in the right way. And I think the right way to do it is from like what you're doing, like, yeah, an infused pesto. It's like somebody might not ever think about that. They might like, well, I don't want to, they associate weed with brownies and junk food and smoking and all those things are unhealthy. And you yeah. can say, hey, guess what? You can actually use the raw plant or you can decarb it a little bit and you can really adjust the ratios. You can do this at home even. Like, is there things that people can do that you would recommend that they can do at home with like flour or extracts they can buy at their local dispensary or even online? So there, there is a ton of equipment that is made for everybody now, just as everybody has a crock pot there, you can go down and for a hundred dollars, you can get a, and I'm, I, I'm going to name all of them, but I'm going to tell you the one I use and I use it because we're making something like you said, that has a medicinal moniker to it. So if I tell somebody, Hey, this has got 12 milligrams in it. I want to be as accurate as I can yeah. because that one milligram over could be the detriment point for them going, Holy shit. I feel like a teenager, you know? Yeah, right. Um, and so for me, it's highly important to get a gadget or a use or a method that is tried and true. And I had some friends here in Seattle develop uh, a machine uh, uh, 12 years ago now, and it's called the Magical Butter Machine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, there's also machines called Levo, and there's another one called Ardent. Mm -hmm. And I will be honest, um, I worked for all three companies on R&D for all of their machines, all three wow. of the machines. Um, and I will tell you that I am still on the R&D team at Magical Butter. I will never be let go. As a matter of fact, we just went worldwide. Um, almost every day we give away 420 Magical Butter machines. Wow. <laughs> um, became Florida's small business of the year. Um, entered into uh, going to be Fortune 500 status pretty soon, I think. I mean, the company is climbing like you wouldn't believe. And I, I've, I've never owned one, but my roommate had one. So I've used them and, and they are a really cool machine because they make that can of butter experience pretty simple. It does the decarb for you. It, so if you want, and, and I've talked about this on the podcast, but cannabis in its raw form does not get you high. THCA is the acidic precursor to THC. If you want to get high, you have to heat it. If you don't want to get high, that's cool. And there's a ton of medicinal value in the raw plant. Yeah. And I explore that oh, yeah. a lot. <laughs> 
but, or maybe, you know, and maybe even like, I think like partial decarbs are kind of cool. Like keep half the THC, you know, there's a lot of ways you can play around with that. Yeah. So Levi, so the, 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 with the research that I've been doing, because, you know, we didn't know none of this. First of all, you asked me what the word decarboxylation meant 25 years ago. And I would have been, what, huh? You know, yeah. what does that mean? You know? And um, so it's a big fancy word for fire. <laughs> yeah. For heat. Yeah. So, yeah. So when we apply heat to these uh, tetrahydrocannabinol uh, com compounds and we, we activate them and we make them um, psychoactive, because like my, my saying that I like to educate people with is there's no intoxication without decarboxylation. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people, some people don't want to get high. And there's big, big, big research right now on does CBD have to be activated to be fully usable if it's non psychoactive, but CBD is psychoactive. We all know that. Uh, so, yep. <laughs> so, you know, my thing with the decarboxylation research has been, you know, I used to do 245 degree internal. That mm -hmm. means the inside of the bud, if the bud was this big, the inside would be 245 degrees mm -hmm. for a matter of 35 to 40 minutes. Yep. So when I got with the University of Washington and Dr. Ethan Russo, we started doing these studies like, hey, if there are 300 components, you can't tell me that they all evaporate, burn off at the same time because they don't. Right. So we, we, there's a big push with CBG right now. Everybody's on that alphabet. So we had to sit. And for three months, as we were doing the COVID and CBG studies, I had COVID, by the way. I fully recovered. Okay. Okay, I was part of Ethan Russo's uh, CBG studies at Washington State University with high mega doses, 3000 milligrams, 3000 milligrams every day for COVID around COVID. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I'd love, we're, we're going to have to have an entire another podcast on that one. Cause I think that'd be a really great. Um, I still don't even have, I'm at about 85% right now on taste. Okay. And smell. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. as a chef, if you lost your taste, um, that oh, would be, a, it'd be, I, I don't really even know how you do it to be a musician that can't hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Beethoven did it. So I guess it's possible, but <laughs> yeah. wow. Um, you know, for for the, that food and that that connection, the lifestyle cannabis is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle for me. It's it's the outdoors. It's food. It's real food. First of all, real food. I'm um, real sustainable food and uh, the lifestyle. I don't smoke a lot of flour now, and I don't know what the high heat nail is going to do. We haven't found all the studies on that, and but I will tell you what that nothing absolutely nothing on this planet gets to you like a dab gets to you. Mm -hmm. Sure. We talk about rapid it. absorption. If you need the effects immediately, I don't think there's a better way than taking a concentrate. Yeah. Um, a lot of people get scared off by the blowtorch and the nail and all the equipment that's used. But I think for people that have never tried dabbing, it, it's, it's, you are heating, you're vaporizing cannabis hash. That's what yeah. it is. It's been done for thousands of years. It's not, you use a blowtorch, you know, you use a blowtorch to make creme brulee too. I mean, it's not, it's not that scary, but it's when you bust out the blowtorch, you know, sometimes around the family members, they're like, this yeah. isn't weed. I'm like, no, it is. I promise. It's just weed. <laughs> so when I had my bar uh, about five, six years ago, I had a bar. It was my last food service operation that I had here in Vancouver. And it was a craft cocktail bar upstairs and it was a dab lounge underneath. Um, nice. I was right across from the courthouse. Um, all three judges there every night. It was. Uh, <laughs> That's it was a rough, dude. That's what we need. That's what we need. Like, it was a rough and speakeasy, um, and I lived at the bar also because my dad was dying of cancer at the time, and I was just like going berserk. You know, I was like trying to drink myself to death, um, and I really realized that <clears throat> I was right across from the courthouse, and nobody ever said anything to me in three years. Hmm. You would come to the bar, you would ask for the cocktail menu, and you'd say, hey, I heard you got another menu. And if you said it, you got it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was really weird. Yeah. It was like the farmer's market. For me, coming out of prison and still operating in those gray areas is, is kind of the mentality I got. And, and I'm sorry that I make fun of the suits that are the investors in the cannabis industry that are don't know anything about cannabis, but are just dollar signs. They're just investors, and I understand that. But when they say in the crowd yeah i'm in the cannabis industry and that's cool come on let's go smoke what do you like to smoke what do you like to do what do you like to grow what kind of plants do you like what do you believe in you know what and they're just like that's yeah, not an industry that's not an industry professional they're not a part of the culture and and they probably don't want to be um 
And and that's okay. I you know it's really as this industry matures, we're going to need business people. We need the MBAs and the suits to to grow this industry. We have to, but but yeah. they need us too. And so as long as, as long as there's that recognition that, yeah, both of these camps might not see eye to eye on everything, but we do actually need each other. And there are plenty of bad operators in the cannabis space. That's for sure. You don't have to have a suit to be a fucking (laughs) douchebag. (laughs) So it's, you know, and I'm trying to kind of get over all those prejudices myself because I'm trying to grow my company and I don't think I can do it without investment. So I don't want to badmouth the investors too much, but, but you're right. I mean, a lot of people, especially in the green rush, I know for the California operators, you know, we saw, it, we've seen two waves of green rushers come through this state with yeah. their money and their talk. And we're all sick of it. Yeah. And all, all the small operators I, I talk to that haven't sold out, that still have their heart in the game. You yeah, know? that's kind of why when we earlier were talking about Ruderalis, that's why I wanted to bring attention to Ruderalis. And that's why we formed our company. Our company is an outdoor eco-gastronomic adventure and cannabis psilocybin immersion experience. Oh, man, you were on the, sign me up, dude. I, I am so there. I mean, the psilocybin aspect, and I didn't even know we we're going to talk about this, but I'm glad we are because like that's the next frontier and the two really do go together. And this is, this is medicine. Yeah. You know, and I love mushrooms and weed are the only two drugs I'll do. I mean, I, I don't, I'll, I'll fuck with some other stuff every once in a while, but I mean, it's pretty much natural medicine for me all the way. How, so let's just talk, can we talk about psilocybin and, and culinary? Like what, I mean, I know how to make mushroom chocolates. I've made mushroom tea. Yeah. I've seen it encapsulated. What are some yeah. of the new ways to use psilocybin for product development or culinary purposes that maybe people don't know about? So, you know, we were talking about the correlation between cannabis and culinary and that correlation between psilocybin and culinary is even deeper because of, well, we've been eating mushrooms for a long time. Sometimes we didn't know that there were myotoxins and they were slightly toxic and they had psilocybin in them or psilocybin. Uh, and, and, And that was, you know, it's really weird because I try to a lot of people are getting into ayahuasca, obagang, a lot of these things, but my family doesn't come from a region where those medicines were used. So I don't believe in using those medicines. In Italy, in Abruzzo, there were plenty of mushrooms, um, you know, culinary and psychedelic. So mentally, Levi, I'm going to be honest, there is nothing on this planet that has gotten me rejuvenatively reconnected in my brain then the, the, these right here are TTYs. We have landslides, blue meanies, golden teachers. We cultivate quite a few. My wife does. She's, hmm. she's awesome at that. So these um, are home, homegrown mushrooms. Yeah. Nice. Can you send yeah. me some? <laughs> Off the record. Off the I record. I send 2,000 capsules a week out, bro. And they mostly <laughs> go to New England. <laughs> That's why they're in these fancy bags when they go. <laughs> right, right. Uh, hypothetically so, speaking for the DEA agent that's listening hypothetically <laughs> uh, so for me it's um, we hit on a we hit on a, a, a really good point earlier and people may not have picked it up but it was about like uh, uh, preventative medicine first before trying to fix it when the problem's too bad right so I take a microdose 0.01 once a day it's like in my vitamin thing. I would know? if I had them, honestly. Like I, my friend's making microdose capsules, and she sent me like her seven day supply, uh-huh. and I took it for seven days, and it was like game changing. Like, like and it really was. Like for my whole like, it's just incredible what it does. It like not only the mental but the physical. I, I'm, I'm a runner. I was running my best times. I was running with more joy. It was just it's like, it, it's it just, connected. yeah, right. Right. I feel like everything else is unconnecting my brain, you know, like yeah. all the sugars and even a lot, even the too, too much caffeine and like just all this stuff is like ripping my brain cells apart. And then psilocybin comes in and just starts mending and healing everything. I don't, I just can't, I can't express enough to people how the appropriate use of psychedelics has been so incorrectly demonized. I mean, it's, 
it's like probably one of the greatest harms we've committed as a culture is to demonize these plants and the people worse that use them cannabis. worse than cannabis uh the I agree. Gotten it worse than cannabis yep because these are really i mean cannabis is used by really sick people too but the reason why psilocybin is being fast-tracked is because it is showing powerful results in helping people with chronic depression who have tried everything else this guy PTSD who, are, from yeah, who, who are suicidal and, and who see no way out and then they do a heavy mushroom trip under a doctor's guidance or, or whatever and they come out the other side like a changed person newborn yeah i mean how newborn. And then you can scientifically unpack that and go, well, this is, we kind of think this is what's happening and it totally makes sense and it's totally natural and it, it's not overriding things. It's actually repairing. It's not masking. It's not putting a bandaid on the problem like a lot of Western drugs do. It's actually helping to correct it and to help get you in tune with yourself so that you can heal yourself. Our bodies and minds want to be operating at our best capacity, right? All the time. Yep, they do. So we're always trying and anybody that struggled with addiction, anybody that struggled with anger issues, anytime, you know, things go out of balance, it's very, and I think, I think to varying degrees we all have. And, and I think, you know, when you're in those States, when you're at rock bottom, it's really obvious and, and people need that. But even just, even people that are just turning to other things, like you know, I would rather see people take micro doses of mushrooms than even drink alcohol. And I'm an alcohol drinker, drinker, 100%. but 100%. there are, there are these natural plant, but you know, if you're looking to calm down, you know, kava, try drink, drink some kava tea. Like yeah. there, there are so many cool plants that we have made illegal yep. <laughs> that we don't have access to that. They want to sell back to us in a synthetic form that don't work as well. And I, I really liked what you said about who knows how to eat chanterelle mushrooms and and all these expensive ingredients better than the peasants who harvest them and you're absolutely right man having lived in areas like i lived in big sur and we'd have a bunch of chanterelles and people would go and harvest some abalone and we'd get some fresh rock fish right off you know and we'd eat these dinners that were like they would cost a thousand dollars you know at a fancy restaurant literally and like a plate like with abalone and chanterelles and all this crazy stuff and we were all working in right we we're bartenders and waiters and stuff we weren't rich but we were eating like kings and queens because we yeah. lived we knew how to harvest the bounty around us yeah. and then somebody else you know had a wild pig you know they they hunted and they brought it's like the you know rural america actually you know we used to be an agricultural country we decided a long time ago to be a hydrocarbon economy rather than a hydrocarb rate hydrocarb rate economy but we it, we still have it in us americans are not retarded on this issue like we our fingers were in the dirt our ancestors had our fingers in the dirt like all the like you know farming is really big just a little home you know like we have a like my girlfriend's really into like farm she's never farmed in her life but she's super into it now like the pandemic and like she loves it and, like we all these beds now and like more people have probably started garden beds in the last year and a half than ever before Absolutely. But like the more we can get into that and the less time we can spend on screens and the more time we can spend with our fingers in the dirt and understanding our relationship to food and the products we're putting into our body, I think the better off. And, and I think this is a big part of it. I think cannabis has the potential to really influence society at large in ways that go beyond, um, I think, what most people even realize. And I think a part of that is this mushroom debate, because we wouldn't even be having this mushroom debate without the cannabis debate having okay. happened first. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and a lot of people might say, well, it's going to lead to all drugs being legalized. Great. I think that's great. They all should be, yeah. but let's at least start with the least harmful and the most productive, which is cannabis and mushrooms. Yeah. I uh, was really lucky to have been living here in the Pacific Northwest and there's a 27 mile stretch of beach outside of Astoria, Oregon. Um, and Paul Stamets, you know, the great mycologist, mm -hmm. mycologist is from Olympia here in Washington. And, um, I grew up 33 miles away. So his son, Azer, Azer, which means blue, hmm. which is short for Azerescent, hmm. psilocybin Azerescent, the most Of course, that's Paul Stamets' kid's name, yeah. of course. <laughs> it wouldn't just be Joe. We all know that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, growing up in that area uh, on the beach, um, it's a 27-mile stretch of dune grass where uh, Azies grow wild. And um, that was my first foray into psilocybin. 
was eating freshies off the beach and just losing your gourd, you know? Um, <laughs> I bet those were freshies. Kids, yeah. <laughs> oh, freshies That's awesome. a little different, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I prefer freshies all the time. All the time. What yeah. happens when you quick, I wanted to ask you this cause I don't know the answer and you might, what happens when you heat psilocybin? Is there a similar thing with cannabis where you need to heat it to get the effects or how is it different in its raw form than it's heated? So form? There is destruction. Obviously there's destruction. If you want to keep, um, the psilocybe in the dish at a good amount. Um, you either use dried and reconstitute or use freshies and use big ones. So the psilocybe on the inside will still retain. Hmm. Um, another good thing is to finish with techs. If you make lemon tech or blue water, mm-hmm. just finish the dish with the tech or the blue water. What's um, blue water? Uh, so you can't really make tincture out of mushroom. Um, a lot of people do, but if I've it's always wondered that I've never tried, I've always wanted to try it though. Don't, don't, you're wasting your time. Okay. So won't act like that. The, the, the first part about it that you have to learn is that psilocybin is water soluble and fat soluble. So you have to do two different, uh, extractions to make it right. Mm. And if it, if, if your water ends blue, then you did it right. And mm. I've ended with a lot of shitty brown water all the time and never blue water. Hmm. I've just barely started to get this right after probably 10 years. Is that a temperature thing or what? How do you go from blue to brown? It's all cold. That's the hmm. thing. It's just doing your processes right. Um, so the, the other thing is, is that when we talk about the regenerative or rejuvenative properties of these mushrooms, when I make a dish or a capsule out of the psilocybe, I also add reishi, chaga, lion's mane, and turkey tail. The herisium or lion's mane is another hugely regenerative mushroom. It's going to help connect those sparks and help the psilocybe connect in there. Um, you, there's actually more benefits to herisium than there is psilocybe, but mm. most people are still, they're buying these mushrooms from a source that's growing them in a lab in a garage. Right. And that's great, but that's not, that's not what we need to be doing. Even when companies are doing that, we need to be getting closer to a wild source so that it is more natural it's more unadulterated it's in its state because if we can put those natural things in our body then we're going to be that way right right um so i always practice so this year my wife and i are actually camp ruderalis is an outdoor adventure society so this year we're holding the auto flower cup on uh, a 1940s scuba resort where the beatles filmed the video where the first underground footage of a Pacific Coast octopus was filmed by National Geographic. And it's 400 yards on the other side of the sound where I was busted in a boat with 32 pounds of cannabis. (laughs) So it means something to me. So there'll be 300 auto flower growers converging on this resort. There's foraging forays, there's wild psilocybin uh, educational classes, auto flower educational classes, joint rolling competitions, last dab standing competitions, educational. What the fuck is an auto flower? First of all, you know, um, some of the best geneticists in the world. I'm bringing geneticists all the way from Spain, um, all the geneticists from around here. The boys from Humboldt, Humboldt Seed Company are coming up. The girls from Hembra in San Diego, one of the first female owned seed companies in the world. Uh, nice. The girls from Hembra are coming up um, and we're all getting together and we're, eating wild oysters off of the beach, grilling them over a fire, eating mushrooms, foraging for mushrooms. Last year I did it at a campground in the middle of Oregon and I got about 200 participants. I got about 25 entries. Um, And then people were just like, why don't you do this more? And I said, well, because I can't, I'm just too busy work. It's a lot of work. You know, first of all, the party costs $90,000 to throw and that's, I don't have that. I have the money. I got to get that from people. Um, but when I put the feelers out there, like in three days, I had $140,000 in the bank and everybody, all these big sponsors are like, throw this party, throw this party, throw this party. So I was like, shit, okay, throw this party. I, are, are you the only auto flower competition in the world? I don't know of any others. There's two. There's the auto flower world cup in Spain. Okay. And if you win from us, you get an automatic entry into the mm. World Auto Flower Cup because it's five grand to enter that. Interesting. So any growers listening with some autoflower, 
this is you got to sign up this is this is really cool and i think i think it's important work too because of not only to honor that other um side of the plant the ruderalis species that doesn't get enough attention but also it's going to have an impact a huge impact on agriculture obviously i mean this is a better way to do it yeah commercial grows up here walden cannabis is now 40 acres of autos Mm -hmm. Hmm. we've got people are flipping because they can flip their money and if they're only shooting for 20% THC, they find the genetics that match it right. to go. And Washington State, correct me if I'm wrong, Washington State is not doing much full-term outdoor. It's mostly indoor and greenhouse, right? Well, so we have, no, there are a lot of tier, there's a lot of tier twos there. It's a good mix. It's a good mix. You're right. It's a good mix. It's a good mix. Um, I, I just know so, one grower in Washington State and he, and he does, he's indoor and light depth in a greenhouse outside of seattle and the weed i mean every time i've ever been up to washington i've always gotten really good like lemon haze and kind of the more like jack herrera haze vibe (laughs) blue city diesel super lemon haze jack herrera those are like i associate that type of genetics with washington state you just named almost all of the concentrates in my concentrate box (laughs) there we go (laughs) see is um does phenomenal out here yeah um, all of the cushions do well we got moisture in the air mm-hmm. um, but we have a lot of our own things like i'm smoking on a strain right now called mount hood magic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. so and that's got a durbin cross in there and like a northern lights number five like and those oh. are the best man i, I love that because you know i know like you know like cookies family is kind of taking over the scene you know with the genetics and there's some cool shit i like all the cakes that are coming out you know i just smoked a bunch of london pound cake and ice cream cake and i went on a cake like mission i was like i want to understand the cake strains you know so yeah. i like got them all and they're really good i mean i love weed i love it all they're gassy um, to me they're gassy they got they're that super gassy cake. they're but the, the nice thing about the cake strains is they're gassy but they're kind of creamy that there's yeah. like this nice creamy undertone that that's actually really good. But I think the best is like, I don't want these homogenized strains. I don't want everything to be GMO cookies in a bag. I want to see what Spokane Washington is doing. And I want to see what Redding California is doing and what bumfuck Idaho. Like I want to see what the growers in those areas have taken this stuff and made it their own, you know, and especially if it's outdoor, then there's like the terroir and the, the local environment, just like the mushrooms that kind of absorb it um but really cool stuff man i it's amazing i don't know how you have time in the day to do all this stuff i mean it sounds like you're extremely busy um you've got your ruderalis the autoflower cup you're a member of multiple culinary boards outside of cannabis and and you participate in r&d on a lot of companies it sounds like you're a busy guy um it's really great to have you on the show i think i I definitely want to bring you back um, to talk about a million other things that we just scratched the surface on today. Um, but so really you know, fucking we, cool, man. We talked about Paul Stamets and we talked about the mushroom thing. Uh, right, right now, one of the projects that I'm working on, I'm working on with uh, a lady named Eugenia Bone, and we're putting together the fantastic Food Guy movie cookbook. Oh, nice. Right on. Yep. I watched that. That was a good one. I'm excited I, about I, that. We'll, well, let, Ghost, let, Ghost too uh have i seen dosed i think so i've watched so many like weed movies um i don't know let me write that down dosed yeah okay i'll try i'll check it out i think i have but what's it about it's about um getting uh heroin addicts uh on the psilocybin and getting okay them off. No, no, i have not seen that i'll definitely watch that yeah good man yeah good yep um well right on man um I'm glad you like the products. Thanks for the feedback on the Cassian orange. Cause that's sometimes people, you know, I really want, I sent it to a couple of chefs cause I know, I know I can trust them to tell me the truth. Cause I don't need people to tell me they like it if they don't, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I can't always trust my mom, you know, to be honest <laughs> with me, <laughs> but you know, the, you know, the cannabis plant, you know, and every strain is so different. And, you know, I love to just like eat nugs, you know, like, you know, if you're buying a $50 eighth from the dispensary, you probably don't want to do it. But if you ever got a nice little, amount if you're ever on a farm i just want to get people out into the farm i don't think people know what it's like you know and i want them to experience it and they got to get back to that yeah it ha- even though they got greenhouses carrots got greenhouses kale's got greenhouses yep. you got to get back to the farm mentality and i hate to say that that's why i make you know when i make the comment when i make the comments like the, you know farmers in suits it's to get the people to think 
back to what you're just saying. It's not to be derogatory towards them. It's to get the, whoa, hold on a second. What is a vegetarian wearing leather shoes for? Or why does a vegetarian have a leather seat? Or does a vegetarian eat off a of bone china? Or does a vegetarian eat sriracha? Because the sugar in sriracha is filtered with bone. Yep. I know when I, when I learned Sriracha has so much sugar and it, it really bummed me out. I didn't realize they put so much sugar in Sriracha. Yes, so I developed a Sriracha for Fairwinds cannabis up here, but we had to develop it in, uh, in the tincture category. So it's an oil base. So it doesn't have any pepper in it. That's uh, perishable. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So being a diabetic, you probably, um, you could, you know, have you ever thought about making like an infused product line for diabetics specifically? I know because then that pigeon holds them in what to eat. And I want to get them to go and eat kale instead of the chips that they are eating to give them diabetes. Right, right. I, I want to make them rethink. I don't want to re-educate. I want them to revert back to what is true. And that is, well, you said it five times. The inconvenient, the con all, all America wants is convenience. The drive through yeah. is never going to leave. Right. And yeah. it's just getting more and more and more like that with everything. It is, you know, and the algorithms are like, I think, um, like a Frankenstein that we've unleashed on ourselves that we're really going to regret because yep. these algorithms, you know, and I'm using them for my YouTube channel. It's like, you got to put the right title, you know, and you got to make things seem more dramatic than they really are. And an algorithm. Nobody yeah. seems to understand that. What's an algorithm? Hashtag. Right, right. It's yep. their way to get you to use their algorithms. It's just like, here's the thing. I got, I got two family members that work for Facebook, work for Instagram. They put the big old fucking things out in the desert over here. Everybody thinks that Instagram goes after and looks for people and creates algorithms that go after weed people. Wrong. They don't. They never have. They don't care if you put the word cocaine, methamphetamine, any of that in anything. All they listen to is rats and snitches. If you get reported by somebody that doesn't like what you do, then they go and look. Hmm. Other than that, they don't spend their time looking. Hmm. It's all rats and snitches. Hmm. Yeah, I know there's a lot of that backstabbing that goes on in the space because you can, you can really derail somebody's brand if they're trying to get launched, you know, and they, they, and they build up 5,000, 10,000 followers, and then you rat them out and they have to start over. I know that happens a lot with cannabis brands. Levi, Fairwinds Cannabis, one of the companies I work for. James did $44 million in sales last year. He's the highest grossing cannabis company in the state of Washington. As a matter of fact, the only other company that did close to him was a dispensary here in my town that did $104 million. That's not a producer. That's a dispensary. Mm -hmm. James did $44 million a year last year. James hires at $65,000 a year a person with a law background to work 20 hours a week to field all of the I-502 rat complaints. Hmm. All he does. Hmm. And most of them are all based on Instagram reports. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's, that's, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, money, more money, more problems. Um, that's for sure. Well, um, I think it's about time to wrap it up. I, I know you're busy. I don't want to take up too much time, but can I get you back on the show in the near future? And, and we can talk about anything and everything, man, because it's, it's really good to uh, get to know you and, and just to see what you're about. And I'm going to make sure and let people know where they can find all of these organizations um, that you're a part of. I'm really interested in the Auto Flower Cup. I just think that's super cool. In November, our next event. So after the Auto Flower Cup, we have an event in Palisade, Colorado on a cannabis farm. Usually we bring them bring the governor of Colorado in and everything. Last year, I was uh, eight, eight hours before the dinner with the governor of Colorado. And he comes to me and says, Sebastian, we got to cancel the dinner. And I was like, oh, you're fucking kidding me. And I left, went home and got COVID from there. <laughs> it was so funny. So the, the this year, we've got a uh, wild psilocybin symposium happening in November on the mm. coast um, that we haven't advertised yet. And the reason why we haven't advertised it yet is because we kind of keep these things. These are semi-private events. Yeah. You know, yeah, they're open to the public, but they're more members only. Yeah. Yeah. Well, somebody's going to have to watch this whole interview to really get the scoop on it. So for the people that sat here and listened to this for an hour, you've got the inside <laughs> scoop on some of these secret, um, some of the, like the underground culinary stuff is like the coolest stuff that happens. Like it's anybody that's never been to like a pop-up. Yeah, like you're going to get your best, most creative chefs 
you're, you're, you're going to have the best food of your life. If, if there's a pop-up in your area, especially if you live on the West coast, I'm sure there's stuff everywhere, but if you're in an agricultural region where there's farmers, find your local pop-ups and then see if anybody's doing some under the table psilocybin or cannabis pop-ups. Cause I know they are. And uh, I, I, I want I some. I do. We do regularly. Camp Ruderalis was designed to do that, to immerse people in the woods. We have a mobile hookah lounge that comes with us into the forest. Um, and, and really, we, you're picking licorice fern off of the tree. You're making tea out of it. You're adding maybe some cannabis-based terpenes and some cannabinoids. And you're enjoying it right there in the woods. Amazing. Full on in the pines. Amazing. Amazing. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I, my Pacific Northwest roots really need to get watered because I'm drying up down here in Southern California, but um, I do like the weather down here. (laughs) If you can come up Levi anytime, you're uh, more than welcome. And I got you taken care of it. Any of the festivals that we throw and they're kind of small. They're only people. Well, yeah. Well, if you're down, I know you you do some work in LA um, with some restaurants I was reading. So I don't know if you're still doing that, but if you're ever down in the Los Angeles area, hit me up. Um, coffee Expo. This year, I'll be at the Coffee Expo. I have a new, I have a new product I've developed with the uh, Norwegian Olympic team, and I developed two products with them. Actually, one's a bone broth, and one's a coconut mm. creamer. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I developed that for the owner of Futurola. I don't know the joint rolling paper, the paper sure. company. Oh yeah. Uh, he's from Norway, so he came to me with the kind of weird concept. And hmm. we're actually those are two of the products in the High Times Hemp Cup box, and they're also two of the products that will be feeding the Norwegian Olympic team this year. Which Amazing. I'm psyched. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get get those MCTs and all of that biofuel. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm a fan of the bone broth. Um, well, cool, man. I, I, it, I got a lot, you know, to, to unpack from this because I, I think, I hope it was valuable for people. I know I, I learned a lot today and, and, you know, just can, you know, ingesting cannabis is more popular than smoking it now. Yeah. And I think in the baked goods and the sugar delivery model is going to, I think, always be there, but we're going to see this massive rise in people that want the savory and the people that want to explore the different psychotropic levels of cannabis, because, you know, like we've talked about a lot, you know, you can ingest the raw leaf and it doesn't get you high at all, but it's the most nutrient dense, you know, thing on earth just about. Um, so just the, the nutritional value, you know, if you're a bodybuilder and you're not incorporating cannabis into your diet in some way, you're fucking up. If yep. you're an, if you're an Olympian, if you're a surfer, even if you're just an average runner jogger like me, you can have massive gains and massive recovery, shortening of recovery time with cannabis. I mean, that, that's, that's one of the main uses I, I use it is to, you know, in athletics, you know, how quick you can recover is the game changer. I think like 80% of professional athletes use cannabis when they're asked yeah. anonymously yeah. that are active right now in the yeah. NFL and NBA because yeah. it works. They're not trying to get high. They're trying to get their hamstrings to, to repair quicker, you know. I got a close buddy up here in Seattle. He happens to be, uh, he's got two of those Super Bowl rings on. His name is Lofa Tatufa. Mm-hmm. And uh, he owns 1937 Farms, which is an extremely craft cannabis farm. Mm. And he also owns Zone In CBD. Um, and it's just like my recipes. He, he, he wants people to do this. I have a CBD product and I have a cannabis product. Just like the salad recipe that I have in High Times. It's got raw cannabis. It's got cannabis infused olive oil. It's got cannabis infused vinegar. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that building that cannabinoid pantry is my biggest push for people. When they go to a baked good, don't only put cannabis in it, put cannabis infused vanilla in it. Right. Put, you know, anything that you can get cannabinoids in will feed your endocannabinoid system, which means that your recovery time is just that much quicker. Right. Yep. No, it's amazing. Um, well, I'm excited for people to to check out your stuff and what you're up to because you got a lot of cool projects and just the pictures on your Instagram are beautiful and the food you make. I can't wait to try it myself um, someday. So thank you, Chef, for being on the show. Um, I look forward to having you back. And uh, yeah, happy eating out there. Say hi Definitely. to the Pacific Northwest for me. <laughs> I will. Hope to see and talk to you soon. You have a good day, man. Will do. All right. Peace, brother. Thanks for joining me today on Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I've been your host, Levi Strong. Full transcripts of today's episode are available on our blog at awakenedeveryday.com. 
If you'd like to listen to more podcasts like this, you can join the conversation on Anchor FM and YouTube. Until next time, peace.